forget all you know about podcasts. We welcome you to an experience uniquely different. Please join us for our coverage of all entertainment on the fringe The candles are lit. The lights are down low. It is now time for our host. As he steps up to the pulpit, the sacrifice has been prepared for the midnight black. Ghastly greetings, groovy, gooly, silly ghosts, and how the hell are you? This is the Rev. Dan Wilson, the Michael Mississippi cult, the devil you know, the dragon, and I'm back for another edition of the Midnight Black Mass, but I am not alone. I have not one, but two co-hosts this week. Uh, First, of course... Our longtime co-host of my partner in crime, the Mouse of Hell, Andrew Alexander. My friend, it's been two weeks. How are you? Hello. I'm good, man. How are you? I'm fan-fucking-tastic and ready to talk some wrestling. Got all kinds of good wrestling discussion. We promised you last week that we were going to have the pro wrestling urban legends discussion. And uh, we got off on the Hall of Fame, or two weeks ago, and uh, that just ate up the whole episode, so we'll keep the intro brief, because we know you want to hear about that. But I do need to introduce, making his debut as a full-time co-host, uh, he was a guest <laughs> for the last three episodes, been a guest in the past, but now he's a regular part of the Midnight Black Mass. Uh, he's a legend in the minds of many in independent wrestling, a uh, guy who's been a King of the Death matches, the winner of the first ever Carnage Cup. Uh, he's he's done so much in his 21 year career. That's wrapping up here now, transitioning into the pro wrestling media, the liberal media. Whoever would have thought the strong stuff psycho tank? Welcome, brother. What's up, motherfuckers? <laughs> Very, Very glad to have ready. you. Ready? Oh yeah, I'm I'm glad to be here. This we don't appreciate awesome. that language. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I think Andrew's just a little jealous about having to share the airtime with Tank. Uh, so maybe we have a, a little in-show rivalry going on that we will use you people at home to fan the flames of. So uh, hashtag it on Twitter, Team Andrew, Team Tank. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, if we were doing this podcast together... Uh, you know, in person, I would definitely say, no, that's not true at all, man. I'm happy to tank the board, and I'm excited about see what happens. But since we're apart and on the phone, I'll say, this is fucking bullshit. This is my fucking <laughs> damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that the competition is hot and heavy, you will have to try a little harder to shine a little brighter. Uh, had a great weekend in the world of wrestling. Tank was right there. At the same event, uh, doing a lot more than I was, but I I did provide the commentary for the upcoming video release of Georgia Premier Wrestling's uh, No Limits. And uh, great event, a huge crowd there in Jasper, Georgia, Pickens County Middle School. And uh, Tank, we we got a question in off the Twitter wire from one Dylan Hales, uh, who said that, uh, it was more a question, more of a comment, but he didn't want me to ask you, uh, what did you think about your... Prophecy about the Atlanta Falcons coming through. Well, it was awesome. Yeah, I fucking called that shit Saturday night. I called it. So, yeah, any Falcons fans out there, you, you can blame me. Fuck y'all. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> so, I had a, had a barn burner knockdown drag out brawl with a cousin Cletus. And left him a bloody mess and beat down all the security staff with furniture. It was a good old time. Uh, what did you think about the GPW event and that crowd? Oh, man, I had a had a good time. I mean, I was uh, they had texted me a uh, week before saying it sold like 200 tickets. And I was like, you know, that's good. You know, for Georgia Indie Wrestling, 200 pre-sales. And I thought, hell, well, the walk up, you know, maybe another, maybe another 100 or so. I get there and there's already 650 people there. I was like, 
Wow, this is a big deal. Jeff Hardy still draws. I don't give a damn what anybody says. Jeff Hardy's still the man, and he still draws. And I got to hang out with him in the back and shoot the shit with him for a little bit, and he's a really fucking cool guy. You know, he didn't come in there with attitude, like, oh, hell, I just had a little indie show. Man, he, he was treating it like it was a big deal. He came in and shook everybody's hand. That was the first thing he did. He introduced himself to every person back there, which, you know, when I see young guys not do that, that's why I'm a bitter old fuckhead. So, children, you need to learn. You need to start shaking guys' hands, whether you want to or not. This I mean, week, I don't like. And I'll walk in, I'll still shake their hand. I had a guy one time saying, saying how come you're always fucking with me? And you make fun of me on Facebook, but then you shake my hand. And I go, because that's what I'm supposed to do, asshole. Learn the business, it's shithead. Simple respect, man. A simple contract between the talent uh, that says, you know, you're here. So I have a modicum of respect for you as someone who's part of this fraternity. Uh, and that's, that's the right way to do it. You know, business is business. I don't like a lot of guys, but, you know, uh, sometimes you have to work with them. So you just need to be professional. Get through it, you know. Uh, but, yeah, same same opinion on Jeff Hardy. Totally blown away by his professionalism. I uh, really hated that. I, you know, I was out there in the booth, so I didn't really get to chat him up because I really, you know, we have a lot of mutual friends and a lot of crazy stories uh, with a lot of those same people. So I really hope to get there and mix it up with him and, and chat. But I was in the back just talking to some guys after the show, and he, of course, comes up to me, you know, and spins me around to make sure he shakes my hand as he's leaving. What a fucking class act. Uh, and an absolute draw. I mean, and, and when you could argue, there are very few. There are very few guys right now. You can put on a poster, and they're going to draw people just on their star power. This shit was like Beatlemania, people. These girls were coming up to him in tears, like they just met fucking Elvis. I am not shitting you. So, you know, uh, mad respect for that. Like, uh, you don't see that on independent wrestling. Uh, and, and like Tank said, Jeff Hardy's definitely still a draw. And the line for his autographs, I mean, hell, we had to postpone the show, you know, for a little bit just to get the people through the line. I mean, he got there at 6.30, and at 7.30, there were still 200 people in line. So, hell, I, I was like, well, I need to sell some shirts. So I just started walking up and down his fucking line selling shirts like a fucking hobo or some shit. <laughs> <laughs> You were like the bootleg guy outside of the fucking concert. Yeah. I was, man. I had my fucking backpack full of shirts. Hey, man, shirts, $10, $10. And hell, I sold like 10 shirts that night. I was happy as hell. I was like, thanks, Jeff Hardy. But I, I can't <laughs> say this. I, I might get heat for it. I don't know. I don't care. But I always looked up to, to Vader as like one of, you know, he was a big guy. He was like always well, one of my heroes, one of my idols. When I got into wrestling, because he was just a big guy, and he is a dick. That's all I'm gonna say. Vader is a oh, dick. Oh shit! Was Vader there? Yeah, yeah. He was. He was like a last minute, you know, add on to sign autographs and shit. And man, he's. Uh, you know, I I know he's in bad health or whatever, and I get I don't know. He's just a bitter asshole. But man. That's why sometimes you don't want to meet meet your fucking heroes because you might be let down, and I was let down Saturday night. Yeah, I didn't even bother because I saw how he was talking to some of the other dudes, and, you know, like I was such a mark for that dude when I was a kid, uh, and I, you know, even later into the business, just thought he was one of the great monsters and really got a raw deal. Uh, you know, after he left WCW. I mean, you know, he had a, a decent run there, but I, I think he was one of the guys I definitely thought they didn't use their full potential, you know, at that time. There was a lot of fans did. Um, and, 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 you know, with his legacy in Japan and everything else, like he's just, he's such a, an iconic wrestler. And, yeah, I just didn't want to, uh, didn't want to have the image tarnished any further, so I kept my respectful distance. <laughs> You know what you should have done? You should have went up to him and cut your Vader promo on him. I thought about it. So he, I, I broke your ribs. I didn't do it, though. Uh, he, uh, he actually, I will say, he, he, I was standing back getting ready for my match, and he walked back there, and uh, he, uh, he actually spoke to me and shook my hand. 
it was just the way I saw him treat other people, which I didn't like. I was like, man, what an asshole. But, you know, it is what it is. And, you know, he, he made he came up, made some money. I'll tell you what, his line compared to Jeff Hardy's line was like fucking night and day, you know what I'm saying? It was you had four hundred people for Jeff Hardy and about twenty eight people for Vader. And, 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 and then I felt sorry for him. He was kind of like sitting, you know, look at those pictures of Virgil sitting there with nobody in line. But, you know, it, it is what it is. I, you know, he's he's trying to make some money. Uh, and that's all cool. But, like, one thing my wife noticed, because she was sitting right behind this table, he wouldn't even speak to the people. He had some guy that would do the talking for him. So, like, if he asked for a picture, the other guy would say, oh, you got to buy a picture first. So I was like, you know, talk to these people. They, these people look up to you. You're being a fucking asshole. Yeah, like you say, you try to give him benefit of the doubt. You know, he's in bad health. And, uh, you know, regardless of his attitude, he still has my respect, you know, for his uh, his contributions and what all he's done. And I certainly, you know, wish him all the best for his health. But, uh, you know, yeah, I, I definitely chose just to keep my distance after I saw him talking to some of the other guys. I was like, well, you know. Uh, I, I think he did have some complimentary words for Cyrus after the show, so, you know, not to pile it all on him, but, um, yeah, yeah I, I, I kind of <laughs> got the observation and was just like, all right, well, that's good. But the but great event, uh, Caleb Conley, uh, you know, huge moment for him. Uh, he's gone around and done a lot on the end. He's a former guest here on the show. Uh, but he, you know, has really elevated stock recently, going to TNA, and uh, now he's got the big opportunity at this show. He wrestles Jeff Hardy in the main event. Uh, Jeff, you know, goes out there and has a hell of a match with him. Uh, you know, he definitely wasn't slouching. Jeff had his working boots on. And, uh, you know, after the match, he cuts his promo, putting Caleb over, talking about what a great up-and-coming town he is. Well, you have to do that, you know. And that the, Caleb was from there originally. It's like his whole family came. And, uh, you know, what a great moment for that dude. That that was awesome. Oh, yeah, it was, it was, it was cool to see. Like you said, Jeff, he did have his uh... – he had his, his his working shoes on. It was one of those shows where, you know, he was the main event and everybody stayed. You know, nobody came just to watch a couple of their friends wrestle. Everybody stayed for the whole show. So that was a good thing because I was, like, right before them. So I'm glad people stuck around. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, it's, but it's like get back to, like, my little deal. I mean, I had a good time. I did cut a promo. I got cheered when I came out. And I was supposed to have been in the heel role, so – I cut a promo on the Falcons getting beat and got booed. And then about a minute into the match, they're cheering for me again. So I was like, damn it. So, you know, Dan was there. I threw some comedy in, something they hadn't seen all night. But me and Cletus, I mean, me and Cletus, we, I thought we had a pretty good little match for what it was. You know, we just, we, we had, we had the people involved the whole time. You know, we had them into it. <laughs> And uh, then I threw some violent shit in the end, hit him with a hammer, busted him open, and then beat up two security guys. So, and, no word uh, about Cousin Cletus. Go ahead, Andrew. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Well, uh, I was just going to say, you know, Cousin, Cousin Cletus is probably not going to be uh, on anybody's uh, five-star match listing, but uh, dude's a hell of an entertainer and, and probably doesn't get the credit he deserves. He knows his limitations. Uh, he knows what works. He's learned the, the very simple Southern old school style. Uh, he doesn't do a lot, but when he comes out there, every one of them motherfuckers are do si into the Cotton Eye Joe, so he's doing something right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that, – and, you know, a lot of people, they don't uh, – they don't realize that. You know, they're, they're wanting to see all these, you know, high spot, high spot, high spot. We didn't do a single high spot. We fucking – we punched and kicked and, we, and, and made fun of two old ladies. And we had the crowd pretty much eating out of the palm of our hands. Didn't do shit. And sometimes less is better. They didn't see everything. So I was like, yeah, let's throw some comedy out there. And if you ask me, I, you know, like I said, Dan was there. I thought it worked. So I was happy with it. I yeah, told you about that working. I told you about that working hill shit. And you don't never listen. Goddamn. It ain't my fault. They 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 booked it that way. It just don't work. <laughs> Nobody wants, at this point, at this point, especially if you're known. But I mean, it seems like places you go that maybe you 
fans aren't familiar with you, they turn you baby face by the end of your match. But if people know you, they are not going to boo you. It's not happening. For this area, for independent wrestling, you are the Undertaker. <laughs> it's just not happening. You know, that's exactly what uh, Dylan Hales told me. He was like, man, he was like, you kind of, you got the Austin Undertaker Brody by people are not going to boo you. I was like, well, it is what it is. Uh, Dan, y'all have known me for a long ass time. I wrestle the exact same way as a baby face or heel. If I'm a baby face, I'll still cheat, choke, bite, do whatever. And it's just people's prerogative. They can do whatever they want to do. They paid their money. They want to boo me, they can. They want to cheer me, they can. I'm cool with it either way. Yeah, and I mean, sometimes it's just got to be the professional. Sometimes you know, like, putting you in that spot is going to elicit cheers, but you're still menacing and mean enough to make it work. You still get sympathy on that baby face. So even though they're going to cheer for you doing the cool shit, but that baby face trying to make that comeback, you're good enough on it that, you know, they're going to be with him regardless. So... Um, you know, like I said, sometimes it's being a pro, and I think uh, that's something to be commended and something guys ought to know. Sometimes it ain't about you. You know, sometimes it's about just being, uh, it's what's best for the business, what's best for business, what's best for the show. And uh, thanks, you know, a guy that'll do that. As uh, you could see Saturday night, uh, he went out there and made that extra effort to get him against him. <laughs> you know, it wasn't easy, but he did. Because uh, that's, that's what they, why, they needed. That's why he's in no less than two Hall of Fame. No less than two. <laughs> He's in two. I inducted him into I'm two in two myself. I've seen it. Two oh, I know about Hall the Dragon Con Hall of Fame. What's the other one? No, then I'm in three. I'm in the Dragon Dragon Con. Uh, UEW inducted me this year in TWA like three or four years ago. Three Hall of Fame. <laughs> Three-time Hall of Famer co-host. By the way, God damn, I'm gonna, that's gonna that's gonna be be my, my new shtick when they introduce me, three time Hall of Famer. <laughs> my God, it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so, before we get to the meat of the discussion tonight, uh, just wanted to touch on two of my absolute favorite people in the business, and most people's favorite people in the business. Uh, oh, thank you. Rock. We appreciate that, don't we, Tank? <laughs> oh yeah, thank you. Well, you are, but but I, I can't speak for everybody else on you guys. I can speak for me, but I, I cannot. I, I can speak for wrestling fandom when I say that everybody loves the Rock and Roll Express. Uh, Ricky Morton and Robert Gibson, the legendary tag team, been out there working their asses off on the independent circuit and can still out wrestle three quarters of the guys today. Uh, they're two of the most gentle, warm, entertaining, hilarious motherfuckers I've ever been in a locker room with. Finally, in a moment a lot of people thought would never happen, getting their just due and being inducted into the <laughs> WWE Hall of Fame. The story broke earlier. Your thoughts, Andrew, start them off. Man, I'm ex- I'm extremely excited about it. Uh, I didn't think it would never happen. I just, uh, I didn't know when it would happen. I worried that it might might take them too long. Uh, very interesting because pretty much the whole lineup has been rumored and kind of came out several weeks ago. Uh, it seems pretty legit, and uh, there was a tag team on there, the Natural Disasters, and they don't like to double up on on uh, tag teams, women, uh, deceased guys, you know, things like that. Uh, and it's interesting that this one just kind of just seems to come out of nowhere, and they went ahead and went ahead and uh, released it and gave out the information. But I don't care how it happened or what the story is or what the deal is. I'm I'm extremely extremely happy about it because ah, man, there's a lot of guys that deserve to go in, and there's a lot of tag teams that deserve to go in. But like top of the list, right up there with like the Midnight Express is the Rock and Roll Express. Uh, most most definitely. I I saw it this morning. You know, I guess it was kind of rumor over the weekend, and I saw it this morning. And I was, you know, almost brought a – it'll bring a tear to a glass eye, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I'm happy as hell for them because I've been on shows with them. I got to work them a few times. And, you know, growing up, just seeing what – how awesome that they were in the 80s and how great of a tag team that they really are. 
one of the best ever. So, yeah, they definitely deserve to be there, and I'm happy as hell for them. Yeah, and now it begs the question is, you know, is the Midnight Express ever going to come into the Hall of Fame? You know, people wonder about that because the heat was Cornette, but Cornette said he'd do it for them. And, you know, I think you can't induct the Midnight without Cornette. And there's heat there, but you know, as we know in wrestling, nothing is no heat is forever. Uh, they always love to mend those fences and, and bring those guys back. So I can imagine the Midnight's will be going in at some point. But I, I think is it fair to say, without much argument, that the Rock and Roll Express is the greatest babyface <laughs> tag team of all time? Absolutely, of course. Yeah, I mean. Uh, yeah, there's- and there's and there's so many great teams, but man, that God, there's just they're just on a whole other level, man. They're on a whole different level by themselves. Yeah, I, oh, I yeah. can't agree more. And even you know Morton's Hill work was was awesome. And then somebody had posted some videos of some Wild Side shows where. Uh, the rock and roll where it came in with like Bill Barron's guys and they were working heel in Cornelia against the NCW and they were fucking badass doing that. I mean, they can work anything. Yeah, they are probably the best babyface tag team of all time. So, uh, I think this would be something interesting, especially if we go through the Hall of Fame, uh, uh, week by week and who gets, uh, announced. Uh, we didn't touch on it with Angle, but who do you guys hope or expect to see in Dust Rock and Roll Express? I expect probably Flair. Yeah, would be my guess. Uh, hope there's probably some better candidates. Like you know, the Midnight Express would be awesome candidates to induct them. Obviously, even though they're not in themselves, you know who better than their greatest rivals. Um, but you know, there's a, there's a lot of connections. The Rock and Roll Express have some sort of connection to like everybody in the business at some level. But I'd say Flair. What about y'all? I was thinking uh, Arn Anderson, maybe. Yeah. You know, Arn did a lot of work with them. When they were, you know, the horsemen against. But, you know, uh, what Dan said, Flair's probably going to get the nod just for the angle Morton had with Flair for so long and the fucking 60 minute matches they had night after night for months, you know. I mean, I think they could do an off the wall like we saw the New Day and Duck the Freebird uh, last year. It could be someone off the wall, but I, I would expect, I kind of expect Flair to. Uh, I would hope, I agree, I think it would be awesome to see, I mean, Stan Stan Lane and Bobby Eaton, maybe. I know Bobby Eaton is not known as a, as a big talker. He could just say a couple, a couple of nice things and everything. Stan Lane, uh, people kind of forget that he had a little run there as a color commentary. Uh, kind of commentator in the WWE in uh, around '94, so he, he's got he's got the gift of gab. So I, I would love to see them. Uh, Arn Anderson's a great pick; that would be awesome. But I, I think Flair might be the uh, the one they go with. You know, I was just sitting here thinking about it. They could go with Jericho. Jericho always said that him and Lance Storm they took their whole stick off of the Rock and Roll Express. When they were the, whatever the hell they were called, <laughs> in Smoky Mountain. The Thrill Seekers. Yeah, the, the the Thrill Seekers. I mean, they were just a Rock and Roll Express type gimmick. Then you got Dr. Tom Pritchard. You know, he could come in and do it. He feuded with them forever as one of the heavenly bodies. There's so many guys oh. that it's probably going to be Flair. Yeah, that that's my guess. Also, uh, interesting to point out another contribution of the Rock and Roll Express. They kind of created that archetype of the quote unquote blowjob <laughs> babyface tag team. I mean, as a Booker, I've used that to great effect in many territories. I know you have as well, Andrew. Um, you know, it, it, you get two good looking young guys that the girls are crazy about that you know can fly around a little bit and can get that good sympathy. Uh, you know, my my biggest success with the book was probably the new wave, but uh, you know they they just seem to be the archetype for what a, a smaller you know quick like uh, you know a handsome babyface tag team is supposed to be. Oh yeah, the t- teams on every level uh, since the Rock and Roll Express have been using that, uh, whether it be small independents or 
all the way up to guys like the Rockers, uh, an amazing tag team that definitely took a whole lot from the Rock and Roll Express. But they're so influential. Uh, hopefully this opens up a whole generation of guys, of people to check them out. Uh, you know, because you look at them, and you know, I think they would admit, you know, back in the day, especially they came along in a time when the business was becoming very cosmetic. Not the biggest guys, not ripped up, not a lot of definition, uh, didn't have that flashy look uh, that a lot of guys had in the late 80s. But God damn, they, oh, they were so good. Ricky Morton selling, uh, I mean, that helped, that definitely helped make them, but just, man, as a tag team, there's arguably the greatest tag team of all time. I mean, the argument can definitely be made for them. I mean, Easily. I saw it first. I saw it firsthand uh, going to the Omni. One, the first Omni show I ever went to was uh, Flair Morton sixty minute Broadway, and girls legit throwing their bras at Ricky Morton when he came to the fucking ring. I was like, you know, this is just shit you can't unsee. You know what I'm saying? I was just like, man, this is crazy. I was like, I guess fourteen, fifteen years old was like, man, and just the, uh, you know, 10,000 people at the Omni chanting rock and roll. Robert Gibson had a match with Arn Anderson earlier in the night for the the TV title. And then, you know, Ricky wrestled Flair that night. and Just, you know, then they came to Chattanooga and they worked with uh, uh, Raging Bull and Rick Rude a couple of years later. Same thing. Just the crowd just going ape shit for them. Can you picture a young four, uh, a young fourteen year old tank watching the Rock and Roll Express? You know his hormones running wild, and he's thinking, "Man, that's how you get the girls." I got to become a professional wrestler, <laughs> and I can I can look and I can move just like the Rock and Roll. <laughs> <laughs> I think you might have planted a seed. I think I think you might have planted a seed, uh, and I love like sitting around in the locker room with those guys. They start telling us stories about the girls back in the day, and they're like, "Oh, these hey, boys don't believe us." They used to be lined up a mile down the road at the hotel room, <laughs> <laughs> like the goddamn Beatles. <laughs> and a real, and, real uh, quick, while we're on the subject, uh, I uh, I thought it before I saw he gave an interview. Uh, I thought Steve Austin would be the guy, a good guy to induct Kurt Angle, and it seems that that seems to be his. Uh, his choice as well. I know they're kind of, they're pretty big buddies, so that would be awesome to see. I mean, anytime you can get Stone Cold on a show, plus Austin has been a huge supporter of getting the Rock and Roll Express in the Hall of Fame, so I just got a feeling he'll have to be there to see that. So uh, I think oh, yeah. he might be the way to go with Angle. Interesting. I mean, maybe he's the one that ends up uh, inducting Rock and Roll as well. That's that's a good good choice oh, also. That would be yeah, that would be great. So, he's been he supported that for like I mean, when Steve Austin is saying the Rock and Roll Express are the first guys that need to be in the Hall of Fame that aren't. That's you need to put them in there. <laughs> yeah, his opinion carries a little bit of weight. That's a good thing. So, uh, congrats again to Punky and Hoot, uh, two of the, the like the very definition of what wrestling veterans should be. Um, they, they love this business. They love everything about it. They've given their life to it, and it's high time and, and long overdue and glad to see that they're getting this recognition, so congrats again. Uh, so, hope you guys have been doing your homework. So we're going to talk about some salacious content here on the program tonight. Uh, we are going to talk about Pro Wrestling's Urban Legends. Uh just a lot of them have come up again in, in recent online discussion and uh, some recent uh, shoot videos and things that I've watched and heard and podcasts that I've listened to. Uh, these these various topics have come up. So I, I got a few that I want to talk about. Uh, there's so many uh, out there, and some of them are just fucking <laughs> preposterous. Uh, so, you know, the intent here, this information is readily available. This is... Uh, if it's something that, you know, I've only heard without seeing it elsewhere, I, I'm not going to try to bury anybody's, like, personal shit. Uh, but there's still some crazy stuff that probably I've heard that a lot of people haven't. So I uh, want to touch on that. Uh, but want to want to let our new co-host lead here. I know he's been looking things up. 
I know he's been doing his homework and studying for this episode. So uh, what what urban legend do you want to start off with, Strong Style Psycho? The urban legend I want to start out with is actually has to do with the newest Hall of Fame members, the Rock and Roll Express. I have sat in the back and heard Ricky Morton tell the story, but not real sure if it's true or not because, you know, he, he can fib a lot, and you don't know what the hell he's telling a, a legit story or not. But it's the story of the Rock and Roll Express walk in in a, a hotel bedroom or a hotel room, and Jimmy Valiant is underneath a glass table jerking <laughs> off while, a, while some chick is standing on the table squatting down taking a shit on the table. And the whole thing, and Ricky Morton says, he's like, fuck this, I'm leaving, but Robert stayed and watched. True or not, I don't know. Well, I've heard that story myself. And I don't give a fuck what we say on this podcast. I'm going to go to my grave believing that that story is 100 percent true, and nobody's going to. Be <laughs> <laughs> it's a you can only hope, right? And, and you know, I'll preface it with like, obviously, we're not trying to bury any of these guys. We we love the majority of these guys. We're probably going to be talking about uh, most of them. Probably not true. It's just you know another example of the wild rumors that run rampant. But you know, we we do embrace the the carny and outlaw side of the business that just kind of fallen by the wayside. So you know, some of this kind of reminiscent of rock and roll. So a lot of sex, drugs, and rock and roll and poop. Lots of poop going to be discussed. <laughs> right, I'm this. in the I'm in the same boat as Andy. I I I, I hope it's fucking true because that's like the best fucking story ever. But if not, it's still a hell of a story. Someone fascinating, Lane, our producer. I'm tasking you for the slideshow. There is uh, someone somewhere because it's the internet and all things exist. Uh, someone has done an animation. Uh, well, not an animation, but a cartoon, a comic drawing of this particular scene, and it's, you know, <laughs> fairly G-rated, uh, you know, <laughs> but uh, it, it's fucking hilarious, so please find that and throw that in the slideshow, the old glass-bottom <laughs> boat. Uh, <laughs> glass-bottom boat, you make the boogeyman go round. Uh, <laughs> hey, man. Hey, hey, have you just think of that? What? Did you just think of that little jingle? Yes. I swear on my, I swear on my fucking life, I swear on the legend of Brett the Hitman Hart that the same jingle just popped in my head and I was about to say it. I swear to God. <laughs> it's leftover mind control from the Devil's Rejects. We still have a psychic connection. Sorry. I can read your thoughts. I I, I didn't want you to really know that, but it's out <laughs> Well, that's some crazy Damn. shit. You just blew my mind, but <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> so, Andrew, what you got? Man, the, the one that comes to mind when this is brought up, and it's so ridiculous, but it, the time frame is funny because, you know, I was I was like eight years old. But I didn't buy it for a second. It was, Man, I heard it so much. School, I mean, I heard it from adults, and I was like, that's not true. But the old tale about the fucking Ultimate Warrior had died and then he, they replaced him and he came back at WrestleMania 8, but it was a different guy. That old tale uh, doesn't have the humor that this, uh, the one tank just told him. So that's not an urban legend, that's Stone Cold Fact. But uh, that was just <laughs> the most ridiculous shit. Uh, the, the Ultimate Warrior being dead and then replacing him. Like he was a member of Kiss or some shit. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, oh, I remember that, and I always thought, I was like, who, who comes up with this shit? You know, that's the ultimate warrior. That some bitch ain't dead. That's him. I did the run-in, you know? I don't know. People just make that's up some shit, shit you would hear, like, in line, getting ready to go into the building, like, all the time. Like, in, in, you go into, like, the flea market wrestling store, or you go, you know, oh, in yeah. line to get in a show when, you, when you're still a fan. And uh, you know you're you're talking to the other fans. You go into the show. You're you know getting popcorn, looking at merch, chatting it up with the other fans. And that shit would come up like five times a show, every fucking show. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That's like it. I don't know if that's the most absurd, but it's got to be up there. It's just ridiculous. I mean, it, it looks like the same dude. I don't. I mean, his hair was different, but fuck. 
you can get a haircut. Not, it was just, uh, <laughs> it was silly. Well, you know, he came back smaller because of the steroid scandal, so, you know, he wasn't able to be as, as ripped up as he was, and he had the different hair. So, people, like, some people were even like, oh, it's Kerry Von Eric. I've heard that theory, that, that Kerry Von Eric filled in as the warrior on some shows. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's an urban legend that has taken many forms over the years, but I think we can safely say... Uh, by our knowledge of everyone we know in the business and people who actually knew the Ultimate Warrior, that it was indeed Jim Helwig the entire time. There ain't no way it was Kerry Von Eric. That son bitch only had one foot. He couldn't run that goddamn fast. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it would have been kind of hard. Growing up, I heard that. I thought that was an urban legend, but that shit's true, too. That's crazy to think about. Like, I don't even understand how he functioned as a... Because you couldn't tell. I mean, you can go back and look, and I can't really, I don't. I can't tell that shit. Like, I can't tell he don't have a foot. Yeah, it, it's, mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. All right, Dan, go ahead. What's yours? Okay, so, I, I mean, I got a bunch. I, I got one I got to say for the main event, but I'll start out with this one. Since we're talking about cases of mistaken identity, Um, I've heard this a few times, but very seldomly, so I'm very interested to know if any of you have heard this ridiculous fucking tale that some people have perpetuated over time. Uh, So go back, I believe it was, uh, Tank, you can probably correct me on this, I'm terrible with years, uh, bad short-term memory, but uh, bad long-term memory too sometimes. Uh, The plane crash of the 70s, was it 74? Where it was, uh, uh, you know, Gary. Gary Hart, Austin Idol. Yes. Bobby Shane, all that. Yeah, I, I believe it was 70, 73, 74, somewhere, 75, somewhere okay. around there. Okay, so this plane crash happens. Ric Flair is on this plane. Uh, Bobby Shane is on this plane. Bobby Shane that you just mentioned. Who, uh, Bobby Shane? Uh, there's some other podcasts that recently have done like a lot of biographical stuff about Bobby Shane because he's kind of one of the unsung heroes of his era. Uh, the 605 Super Podcast, even though they say fuck all other podcasts, they won't plug them. I like that show, so I'm gonna plug them. Uh, they did a great retrospective of Bobby Shane, uh, but so he was a guy that like he originally did the King gimmick. Lawler kind of kind of took the King gimmick and molded it into his own thing from Bobby Shane. Uh, Ric Flair apparently took a lot of the Nature Boy mannerisms from Bobby Shane. That's where this ridiculous urban legend comes from. So allegedly, according to this myth, this lore, that during this plane crash, it was not Bobby Shane that was killed. It was the Nature Boy Ric Flair. And so Bobby Shane had plastic surgery to look like Ric Flair and assume his life and take his booking. God damn. <laughs> I, I, have, I have heard that legend. I have heard that legend for many, I've, many years. Yeah. I've heard it too. And that's, so, yeah, that, that's much more ridiculous than the warrior. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, what oh, the yeah. fuck? That's, Who that's comes up with this shit? <laughs> that's just crazy. So, yeah. Too. I, I think we could also say without a shadow of a doubt that that is false. Um, <laughs> that the Nature Boy Ric Flair is, was, and always has been the Nature Boy Ric Flair. Uh, yeah, so, definitely. <laughs> so no no Bobby Shane. Yeah, that's bullshit. Wait, are you sure? I mean, is there only one Ric Flair, though? There seems to be multiple. I mean, I've seen, I've seen a lot of Nature Boys out there, you know, they're they're just like him in every way, shape, or form. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know you, you probably don't have vision insurance being a former professional wrestler, but I think we might start a GoFundMe so you can get you some glasses. Uh, there's only one wrestler. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I'll and, be on the lookout uh, for that other one. <laughs> yeah, you, you do that, pal. Get back to me. <laughs> so... So, Tank, what else you got in the bag? <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd looked one up. I never heard it. I, I read up on it that uh, Kevin Von Eric had paid for a hooker to fuck his little brother, Chris, when he was 12 years old, and Chris cried about it. True or false? <laughs> I don't know. What the Yeesh. fuck? 
Well, given the history of the Von Eric clan, you know, there's a lot of crazy things that allegedly have come out of that camp. Um, you know, big fans of all those guys, but, you know, there definitely was some trouble at home. Uh, I think everybody knows that clearly based on the results. Uh, but it, <laughs> that one is, is pretty nuts. Now, um, I've heard a lot, like, I've heard that, I, who was it, fucking Chick Donovan was telling us one night that they used to put cats in the microwave. Now, like, did they even have <laughs> microwaves when he was in world class? I don't know. So maybe it's full of shit. <laughs> Oh wow, <laughs> uh, man! A uh, a big one that I've just always I've just always wondered. Not that I believe it, but it's just in your mind. Like it 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 almost makes sense. <laughs> but uh, just because of hearing the way he uh, he was treated and acted. But what about the big rumors of? Uh, we know why Shawn Michaels got the big push in the WWF in the nineties, don't we? Oh yeah. Well, are you referring to one Ronnie C. Gossett? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I've heard tales from Ronnie P. Gossett for sure. Uh, I've heard several tales from Ronnie P. Gossett, man. That guy was, uh, man, I miss that guy. That He was amazing to be around. But, uh, yeah, I've definitely definitely heard. Uh, it's been a rumor for years that Vince McMahon and Shawn Michaels had a very special relationship and that was why he was able to get away with murder in the 90s and uh, got a massive push like he did. Now, ultimately, if I had to put money on it, I would bet against that. But the stories are out there, and, I mean, the history books show that he, I mean, because I've seen some talented guys, and they don't get away with the shit he got away with. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of other factors there, though. You know, they were in a really down period of business. He was one of their only, like, big stars at the time. Um, you know, there's a there's a lot of reasons for that. And, and it seems that people on the outside just think that the locker room is a giant fucking orgy, like, going through some of these these stories. It's like, like hey, we like to party, and, uh, you know, the boys will definitely get down with some chicks, but, um, you know, usually that's done partying after the shows, not in the fucking locker room when business is trying to be done. So I seriously doubt that that was going on. That's just my opinion. Yeah, I call bullshit on that. But, you know, who, who knows? I mean, there, there, there's been that story with, you know, a, a few other wrestlers in the, for the NWA championship. You know. Like who knows? That, uh, I don't know if it's on anybody's list, that Tommy Rich, Blew Jim Barnett to be the NWA World Champion when he beat Holly Race for that five day run. <laughs> yeah, I knew that. Was you. I just wanted you to say it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's been a long standing one. Now, seemingly has been debunked by most of the people in the office at that time. Uh, oh, but you never know. Uh, you know, it, it's one of those things that just took a life of it on its own. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's crazy how much like sex and scandal and blackmail is a part of a lot of these urban legends. Uh, they, I mean, some of them are just ridiculous. Like I wouldn't even go into some of them. But um, and you know, like anything involving Sunny, we don't, we're not going to touch because I mean, my God, there's so much of that out there. Uh, on other podcasts, we even dedicated whole episodes to to her <laughs> uh, escapades. So. I don't think we really need to go with that. But, okay, so I, I'm going to drop my doozy here. Um, I know we still got a few minutes left in the show, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and give you guys another round to bring up a few more. But my, my doozy is the one that I recently heard on a few of those You Shoot videos that has come up. And apparently it was started by Tony Atlas. And I so, I, God, I hope it's true. I... I I, I just, like, if this is true, I'll be one of the happiest guys in the world. Uh, just because it just lets me know that the business is the business, always will the biz be but the business, no matter how big and glitzy and glamorous it gets, uh, is that during their time in developmental, the Golden Girls, uh, not Maude and Blanche, but Golden Children of the female division in the WWE, the Bellas, Nikki and Brie, we're a little bit wild. They like to, to party a lot in developmental. And uh, the, 
uh, Tony Atlas said, he saw him in the hot tub with not a stitch of clothes. Uh, but, you know, that's pretty tame, according to, uh, to wrestling standards, right? But, uh, <laughs> so, um, what the fuck is it? Did you murder somebody? <laughs> Do I? I hear a meat wagon coming to haul somebody off in the background. Hey, I'm, I'm sitting outside. That's just uh, oh, okay. a po going by. Fair enough. Uh, so, anyway, Nikki and Brie Bell. So, they're apparently pretty wild and developmental. But, you know, getting naked in the hot tub is pretty tame by wrestling standards. But <laughs> he went on to say that they used to rib the greenhorns by breaking into their rooms while they were asleep and taking shits on them. <laughs> wait, wait, who did the shitting? The Bella Twins, <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> Man. <laughs> Man, I hope that's true, too, but I just don't, I don't buy that. Man, I don't. <laughs> I hope it's true, but it, you know, when did this when did this story break? When did this story come out? I have no idea. I, I mean, I imagine the interview I watched was a year or two old, but yeah. Um, other I people think... commented on it and said they had also heard the stories but could not corroborate them. <laughs> so, yeah, it, yeah, it was at I least out there. Want, as much as I want that to be true. It probably is false, but that's fucking awesome. I knew there was something about them crazy bitches. I love me some. Yeah. I love me some Tony Atlas, but uh, I just don't know if he's the uh, greatest uh, source of information out there. <laughs> what? <laughs> You're telling me the credibility of Tony Atlas can be trusted? What can I believe? Uh, <laughs> I just, I don't know. I want to believe it, but I, I'm, I wouldn't bet on that one either. <laughs> like, yeah, they, they are so over with me, if that is true. <laughs> so over. Exactly. Well, man, you couldn't be a, man, who can sleep? Not so, If you pass out, that's different. Who could sleep through getting fucking shit on? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. They the trained it pretty hard in developmental. Maybe they were exhausted. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Tank, does your wife still wake up in the middle of the night when you fart all over? Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, oh, okay. Well, see. Oh, yeah, so she, know, she's she's going to know, you know, when the asshole's rumbling. Yeah, they're, they're pushing. They're, I mean, they're over 10 years being married, and she can't even sleep through that. So I just, I don't know about that. I, I, I want it to be true, but I, I'm not going to believe that one, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's go one more round with you guys. Tank, you got another one? Yeah, I got one. Uh, oh, man, I, I picked out so many, but I, I like this one. I think it's kind of funny. Uh, everybody knows that Victor Keonis at IWA Puerto Rico, you know, he's a little on, on, the, on the gay side, they say. And I well, heard was. He, he's dead now. There was. <laughs> They had said that uh, David Flair went to Puerto Rico to work for him. He came home like, you know, two or three days after he left saying he couldn't live in those working conditions. They were just un unlivable. And come to find out he was staying at Victor Keonis' house and he woke up one morning with Victor Keonis about to blow a load in his face. True or false? <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure that's true. I, I, I seem, I, and you know, don't quote me, but I, I believe that's been corroborated elsewhere with people I knew that were involved in that situation. So uh, if yeah. I'm guessing, I'm going to say true. I'll believe, I'll believe that one. I mean, it's not absurd to think. I'll believe that. Yeah, probably so. Um, This isn't, uh, unfortunately, this doesn't involve... Uh, shooting bodily fluids on people in their sleep. Uh, I wish it did. But uh, and what about the what about the legend, the rumors, the talk that the biggest controversy in professional wrestling history, the Montreal Screwjob, being one big gigantic work. 
Hmm. Thought about that you one know, a lot. Just, you know my take on it. That shit's a work. <laughs> Man, uh, I, I don't believe it's a work. I would be a little shocked if it ever come out that it was, but there's just a lot of evidence that points to it, man. There's just a lot of evidence that uh, that they come up with it in order, because a lot of people won from it, and you know Bret Hart didn't end up winning in the long run because he had his concussion issues, and then the the tragedy with Owen Hart kind of if there was plans to come back around, you know, we never got to see that because of that, those two issues, or we didn't get to see it while he was still active. But Bret Hart gets about $9 million. Vince McMahon becomes the biggest villain in wrestling history, pretty much. And Shawn Michaels becomes the world champion, and he had a back injury about six months later, or less than six months later, so you know, he, he his payoff was cut short as far as that goes, but you know, it just if you look at it that way, man, it looks like a win-win for everybody. Yeah, My I mean, thing, was it a, a ploy to get Brett more money, you know? You know, something I've always kind of, you know, it, if it wasn't to work, you know, it, 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 nobody's going to fucking know until somebody, to one of those two come out and says it. But, like, you know, Bret Hart, they were filming that uh, that uh, Wrestling with Shadows documentary at the same time all that happened. You know, so everybody was going to buy that video or rent that movie to to see the what happened. You know, him beating up Vince and all that shit. I don't know. It's just there's just a lot of stuff that points at being a work. It may not have been. I mean, it, it might be a secret that's going to go to their grave or some. You know, Triple H, all of them. What do you think? Yeah, Dan? I mean, if yeah, Dan. Yeah, I, I think you know it's. Uh... It's a good possibility. I get it. There's a, there's a lot of people that benefited from it, like you said, um, you know, and that that's really the question. Was it a carefully manipulated situation to get Brett paid better, kind of uh, stick it at WCW as well? And, you know, also, like, they were kind of done with Brett. They didn't, you know, have much for him down the line, I think. So, you know, it was a way to spin one of their hot stars off uh, without having to have him stick around to pass the point of exhaustion. Uh, and then, like you said, Vance became the big heel. Yeah, I, I think it's possible. I, I put a question mark, but yeah, it, it, it's a possibility. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think all of. The, I mean, uh, for starters, I don't think it was a mark. I really don't. But I don't think all the other stuff was. I think it just it got to, like you said, with a point where the, the relationship wasn't working out. I mean, this is good playing devil's advocate, of course. The relationship isn't working out. You're thinking about, you know, trying to get your deal with the W, use this as leverage, you know, take some time off, come back in a few years, it'll be a really hot thing. I mean, there, you, you can see the flip side of the coin. Uh, I, I just, I personally don't think it was, but if it was, if it, it's the best work of all time. And it seems that by now, it kind of seems that by now, maybe the truth would have come out just because. And three people can keep a secret if two of them are fucking dead. So what are the odds that this shit is kept under wraps for this long? Yeah. Good point. Nobody's come out about it yet. So um, that's going to wrap it, though, for our edition of Pro Wrestling's Urban Legends Part 1. I, I feel like that a tank said he had a bunch there were a lot that we didn't discuss. So I think that was uh, an entertaining topic we can probably bring back for a future episode. But, of course, we'll be back right here. Same bat time, same bat channel next week, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, of course, I'll be uh, behind the scenes at Why We Wrestle this weekend, February 11th in Cornelia, Georgia, at the world-famous Landmark Arena. Uh, follow us on social media at Why Do You Wrestle on Facebook at This Is Why We Wrestle on Facebook dot com slash Famous Landmark Arena. Um, got a lot of big things coming on. Jacob Maxwell is going to be taking on the Iceberg. Gunnar Miller defending the Triple Crown Championship against the Deadly Sense Seven at a big double main event. Uh, and then also coming up uh, February twenty fourth, Why Wrestles back, and I'll be in Saudi Navy, Tennessee on March the fourth for the Scenic City Rumble. Back in the commentary booth, Tank. What you got coming up? Uh, I will be a part of the Scenic City Rumble on uh, March 4th, March 11th. 
I will be at a, a, a show for Scott Hensley, uh, some church show to raise uh, money for a, a trip to uh, Jamaica or something or for give some kids some ball gloves. Uh, March 18th, I'm at Southern Fried in Monroe, Georgia. March 18th, uh, I forgot where the hell I'm at. I'm somewhere. <laughs> no, uh, no, no, the 18th Monroe and March 25th. I'm not sure yet. We'll have to stick around and see. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder where you might show up. Uh, Andrew, <laughs> they probably can't find, they find you, can they? They sure as fuck cannot. I do not want to be found. I have no interest in appearing at these various wrestling promotions. Fair enough. Fast Eddie Lane, you still uh, hanging out in there? Oh, hell yeah. All right. Well, uh, let them know where they can see you, our, our great producer who brings you the Midnight Black Mass, and we can't thank him enough. What you got? Uh, Saturday night I'm on the 18th of February, back with uh, Peach State Wrestling Alliance in Carrollton, Georgia. Saturday night, the 25th of February, with Global Championship Wrestling in Pell City, Alabama. Uh, the website itself for me is fastheadylane.com, and for the station, beyondringside.com and prowrestlingradio.net. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, you can follow me on Twitter at Dragons Rejects and on Facebook.com slash Rev Dan the Dragon Wilson. Follow Tank on Twitter at Tank underscore EST 1996. And that's going to do it for this week's edition of the Midnight Black Mass. Thank you for joining us. Keep one foot in the gutter and one fist in the gold. Good night.